time for just a moment, please. I gotta uh, move something here. I gave a speech a couple of months ago in this room that made me really uncomfortable. And the reason it made me uncomfortable is because it was very personal. I tend to not speak and, and real personal stuff, but I did, because I was stretching myself. And I was talking about my multiracial family, but I was sharing something that was pretty personal. And it scared me, but I felt really good afterwards because I had really pushed what I, what I normally do. Every speech I do, but I had pushed a little more in, in that speech. And today, I'm going to talk to you about how to do that. So when you push. So I've been here nine years. I've given 29 Toastmaster speeches. And every time I try to do a little more, a little more, a little more, this was beyond that, right? So that's kind of the, the setting. But my goal is to give that speech. Like this speech had been jumbling around in my head for a while, and I just didn't know how to give a voice to it. I'm sure you all have it. There's that speech, it keeps kind of coming up, and you haven't given it yet, and you're trying to figure out where it belongs. And this was one of those speeches for me. So today, uh, we are going to look at tips on how to focus, laser focus that speech, and get it so when you give that speech, your audience will laugh until they cry, or they'll cry, or someone will come up to you and say, wow, that was a really good speech. So that's the, that's the goal of this speech. And they do not have to be serious, by the way. One of my other favorite speeches was me talking about my love of carpool karaoke. So they don't always have to be serious speeches. But as Toastmasters, we love a good story. So when you start Toastmasters, you probably wanted to be a better communicator, but you very quickly learned that it's really about a good story. It doesn't matter what environment you're talking in, it's about a good story. And studies have shown that we think in stories. Stories connect with us to help us remember. Uh, they engage us because we play a mental movie when we hear a good story. And so that's always my goal as a speaker. And I read a lot of articles and look at topics to speak on, all that type of thing. Um, and I've had limited success with that because I'm a kinesthetic learner and what that means is I need to hear, see, and interact, right? I, I need to be involved in it. So articles are nice and you get a few tips. The ones that give examples are even better, but I have newly discovered TED Talks. Now, I've TED Talks been around for a long time and I know that, but I look at TED Talks in a different way. I look at it from the speech craft perspective and it has really changed because of the way I learn, it has changed me and how I develop speeches, which. So I wanna share what I've learned with you guys. And so there are three things out of all the tips that you get from, from people and you read and you see, there's three that I think are really going to help. The first one is immer immerse your audience. The second one is bring your characters to life. And the third is build to that star moment. The star moment is something they'll always remember. So I'm gonna talk about Richard. We're gonna, we're gonna go through these, we're gonna talk about Richard. Richard is a 12 year old boy from Kenya and he was invited to a TED talk. So that's pretty amazing, right? 12 year old kid coming to the uh, United States to do a TED talk and, and he's, like many other 12 year old kids, he's, his voice is kind of changing and he's got this bright, happy, exuberant personality. Uh, so he's much like a 12 year old boy, but 12 year old kids in Kenya are very different than 12 year old kids in the US, I'm just gonna tell you right now. And here's why. So his job and the job in his village for preteens is to protect the herd of cattle from predators. So the cattle is their means of eating, it's their means of making money, and so predators, in this case, are lions. They have to protect the herd from lions. That's their job. Well, lions are nocturnal animals, and nocturnal animals mean you're out there in the middle of the night, and we're not talking like now where there's street lights. We're talking pitch black. So you're a 12-year-old boy. You're out there, and you're with the cattle. And he didn't like this job, and we all, I don't know, we all would understand why. And you try different things to deter the lions from coming in. And the reason they especially had a problem with the lions 
is that their land is right next to the Nairobi National Park. And he showed a picture, and it was him, and then his cattle in the background, and in the very back, you saw this lush, these huge trees, and all this green uh, brush, and all this, it was just beautiful. But when the National Park ended, and their land began, it was pretty obvious, and their land had like tall grass, and it was kind of brownish, like what you would think it would look like, I guess, from not, from not ever being there. But you could see the difference. And so the park is just beautiful, and I'm sure it's great to live near there but it doesn't have a fence on their end of, of the park. That means that zebras flow back and forth freely, they eat their grass and all that's fine, but with zebras come lions, that's the problem. So Richard had, had this job at staying up night doing this kind of thing and he really didn't like it. And one day he was out there and he had a torch and he's just kind of playing around, you know, just, you know, just doing this. And then um, he realized that there were no lions. It's like, okay, so he tried it again and again, and there were no lions. So he thought, I have an idea. So I'm gonna step away from the story for a minute. So Richard has now immersed us in his story, right? We want to know what happens. So he goes on to tell that he had this idea of, of uh, taking motorcycle turn signals from old motorcycles and he created this with a battery and they have a wire fence and these things and he did this all on his own and he would group the, the turn signals in two or three and they would go be around the fence and they would flash. So he thought he'd try it and see. First night, no lions. Second night, no lions. And he's like, I've got it, I've solved my problem. He can sleep at night, he's really, really happy. Well, an elderly neighbor said, hey, can you do that for me? And he said, of course I can do that for you. So he did it for her and then pretty soon other neighbors and other neighbors, seven neighbors, he installed this. And he taught his friends how to do it, so they were helping. So his friends were learning how to do this great creation that he had, etc. And word had gotten out, and a university in Kenya offered him a scholarship to their school. So now he gets to go to this great school and do these, and, and go to the great school because of something that he created. And with the school, they liked his idea so much that they helped him fundraise. And when they helped him fundraise, this, it was able to get this invention out to all places in Kenya because predators aren't only lions, but they're hyenas and leopards and elephants and other things. So this was helping everybody. And Richard has done all this, right? He's just doing something to help himself. But in his story, he has now brought characters to life. So now he's immersed us, he's brought characters to life. So he goes on to say that when he was in the fields, every once in a while, uh, when he was in the fields, every once in a while an airplane would fly overhead. And he would daydream, like, oh, one day, if I could ever fly in an airplane, and never thought in a million years that that's something he could do. Well, he's at this great school, his invention's been moved all over Kenya, and TED Talks asked him to come speak in the United States. So he flew in an airplane, which he never thought he was gonna be able to do, he spoke in front of an audience of hundreds of people, millions of viewers, and did that. And a pilot heard about Richard's story. Richard, he's like, hey, why don't you sit in the cockpit and I'll take a picture of you. And they showed him in the cockpit and his smile could not have been bigger. So he's showing this picture and then him even bigger. And he said, I got to sit in the cockpit and that's when I knew I wanted to be a pilot. That's the star moment. That's something you're always gonna remember. A seven minute speech by a 12 year old young man, and he hit all of those, and it really impacts you, right? And you all have that in you. So at the beginning of the speech when I said, what's that one that jumbles around your head, your soul, like what's that speech? If you think about this, it really will help you focus it. So a way to get started is we have a YouTube channel. I hope you all know that. Greg and many others help um, videotape our speeches so we can see. So take look at a speech that you have done and look at a speech and look for these three things and see what you did well, what maybe you could improve, what was your star moment. Because when you do that and you, and you formulate your story, the result you will get is your audience will laugh until they cry or they will cry or they will come up to you and say, wow, that was really great. And I cannot wait to be in the audience when I hear that speech. <laughs>